we are going to talk. This is going to, Elizabeth's going to do a brief uh, present overview of how this is working, and then we're just going to have a conversation. We're going to go for a little while, and then I'm going to ask if you have questions. And so get ready. Um, if you don't have questions, I'll start calling on people I know in the audience, and I know enough of you that uh, we, we can do that. Elizabeth, please. Thank you, everyone, for having me here to talk about this project. We're very excited about this new initiative. So the plan for a healthy Los Angeles is a new health and wellness element that will be incorporated into the general plan. As part of this effort, the city of Los Angeles is really looking at an opportunity to elevate health and social equity as part of its planning document in the general plan. So what is the general plan? I'm sure we all know the answer to this. It is a long-term visioning document that really establishes the constitution for growth and development in a city. In the state of California, every city is required to have a general plan, and there are seven mandatory elements. However, cities have the opportunity to create additional elements if they feel there are pressing issues that are not addressed through the mandated elements. And in this case, the city of Los Angeles is moving forward with the new plan for a healthy Los Angeles as a health and wellness element. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The first phase of this project was really focused on conducting data analysis, and it was really in preparation of the Health Atlas, which is a data-driven report that looks at over 100 indicators and outcomes across the city. I'm gonna share a few of those with you today to really elevate two of the most um, pivotal things that we learned from this report. And the first was it helped us identify the most pressing issues that relate to health and well-being. The second was when we identify those issues, what are the communities in the city that are most impacted or suffering from the greatest health disparities? So the first map is the hardship index. It's a map that really looks at socioeconomic conditions. It looks at overcrowded housing, poverty, excuse me, <coughs> employment status, education, focusing on folks with low educational attainment. It looks at age, focusing on vulnerable age populations such as children and the elderly, and income. When we look at all of these indicators together, the areas on the map with the darker coloring represent the communities in Los Angeles that have the greatest hardship. In Los Angeles, the Southeast Los Angeles community area, which is the, uh, the lower eastern portion, is a community with the greatest hardship. <coughs> this map looks at life expectancy at birth, and life expectancy at birth is a statistical analysis that looks at the risk of premature death, and it could be due to disease, crime, etc. So the red represents communities in the city that have a higher life expectancy. The pink or the more muted color represent the communities that have a lower life expectancy. And as we can see here within the same city, we have two communities with a 12 year difference in life expectancy. Childhood obesity. Again, the red represents a higher prevalence. The lighter color pink represents a lower prevalence. Again, we see the disparity. In Brentwood, we have folks um, or children with 11% childhood obesity as opposed to Boyle Heights, Harbor, South and Southeast Los Angeles, which have 30% of the kids or, or more that are suffering from childhood obesity. This one's a little challenging, but I'll walk you through it. So this looks at healthcare professional shortage areas and essentially focus on the areas that have the cross hatching. Those areas are the areas in the city that are underserved and access to healthcare professionals, which is very daunting when you see the previous maps that show those are the same communities that are suffering from the various chronic disease issues. Here we see motor collisions with pedestrians and cyclists. The darker the color represents a higher rate of collisions between motorists, pedestrians, and cyclists. And if you see the black dots, those represent pedestrian fatalities. In Los Angeles, the Southeast Los Angeles community area, which is again the lower southern portion, it faces the greatest impact around these issues. And this final map is the Community Health and Equity Index map, very similar to the first one I showed the group. <coughs> It's a compilation of various indicators with sub-indicators within them, but essentially those are the broad categories we're looking at. Demographic, conditions, socioeconomics, health conditions, really looking at chronic disease issues, land use, assessing whether neighborhoods are walkable, whether we have a mix of land uses and communities, transportation, can folks take public transit, can they walk in their neighborhood, food environment, we look at whether people have access to healthy food, crime, focusing on violent crime and pollution burden, essentially looking at the impact of and exposure to pollution in neighborhoods. So again, group it all together. The areas on the map that are darker are the areas that are most impacted around these various issues. So I'm sure we all saw a very consistent theme. Um, regardless of the issue we look at, it's a consistent issue and it's consistent communities that are impacted by these conditions. So I think this map was the most critical in really guiding us in our community engagement efforts to really go out and have conversations with folks that live in these communities to really inform the development of the plan for a healthy Los Angeles. So we have gone anywhere we've been invited to. We've gone to bike rides, workshops, health fairs, 
We also have three advisory groups that have been very instrumental in developing this document. We have a community advisory committee, which is made up of 30 plus organizations that are spread out across the city, focusing on these various issues, but most specifically targeted in those communities that are suffering from the greatest health disparities and the community health councils is on our CAC as well. We have a technical advisory committee, which is made up of 30 plus public agencies, mostly city departments that have been instrumental in developing the document. And finally, and definitely not least, we have our expert panel, which is a group of 15 innovative leaders that have been talking about this, studying this, and doing things about these issues for years. And three of our expert panel members are here with us today. <laughs> so. These are the issues that were really elevated as part of our community engagement efforts. And as you see, it's very consistent with the data. We, the data was ground truth. These are the, the really the hard topics that we need to look at as in, in any conversation really that speaks to health and well-being in Los Angeles. So where we are now in the process is um, we are gearing up for the public release of the Plan for a Healthy Los Angeles. It will be available for public comment on Thursday of this week, two days from now. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so uh, right here, I, I essentially am outlined the major goals that we have as part of this effort. So in really developing the plan, one of the very critical exercises that we had to do was really evaluate the existing general plan to identify policies that were already in place that spoke to these issues. And when that is the case, we do not repeat the policy or duplicate a policy, but we do seek to reinforce it. Um, as you all know, I'm hoping the mobility plan is currently being um, updated, which is the transportation element. So they are very much focused on the transportation and the public space, active recreation, all of that stuff. Um, and we, again, reinforce those efforts, but we don't duplicate policies. Our goal and our task as part of this effort was to really identify the gaps. These are very important issues. What is the general plan not currently addressing? And that is what we moved forward with. So briefly, those are our six goals. First is a city built for health, and that really speaks to the role that the built environment plays in either making it easy or challenging for people to make healthy decisions and live healthy lives. Bountiful parks and open spaces really speaks to the role that parks play in living healthy lives and being in a healthy community. <clears throat> parks are those places where people can engage in physical activity, social interaction, and really are supportive environments for mental health and well-being. Food that nourishes the body and soul speaks to access to healthy food, we really want to create a local food system, facilitate the process for people to grow healthy food in their neighborhood, and certainly increase the number of healthy food retailers and underserved neighborhoods. An environment where life thrives speaks to the role that our environment um, plays in health and well-being. And really, through this goal, we're targeting efforts to incorporate considerations and mitigations for communities that are most impacted by these issues. Lifelong opportuni opportunities for learning on prosperity really speaks to the role that economic prosperity plays in health and well-being. Poverty is one of the most, if not the most, significant health indicators. So as part of this goal, we're really seeking to create career ladder employment opportunities and really foster educational programs for low-income communities. And finally, safe and just neighborhoods speaks to the role that concerns over public safety can play on whether folks engage in healthful activities. We have some folks that live in a community that do have a neighborhood park, but if you're concerned for your safety, you're not going to walk there and you're not going to use the space. So it's really about creating safe public spaces. So again, public release this Thursday, um, it'll kick off a 90-day public comment period. We will be having seven public hearing planning forums across the city, and we will actually be going on in conjunction with the Mobility Plan 2035 folks as well as the Three Code folks. So we encourage you all to attend. This is our project information. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, sign up for our listserv, and um, we look forward for you being involved in our project. Just a couple of quick things before we turn to the panel. I know that some of you are very deeply involved in this kind of stuff, some of you are not. So why should real estate developers and planners care about health, right? At some level, this has been my job for the last 20 years to remind my students about the answer to the fat question. So the obvious ones, the ones that, it, that most of us understand are parks, mobility, land use. Those pop up immediately as planning development issues. How do we actually parcel out the land use? How do we decide where the parks would go and how people will use them? How do they create an amenity for, for, for neighborhoods? The ones that are trickier for us to immediately see the connections are poverty, environment, food, and safety, and justice. And yet, you already know, having been in this school for how long it's been, that they're not actually separate from those first set of uh, issues. Where you grew up matters, as Elizabeth has showed us in those maps. 
when the kind of environments we live in matter. The kinds of uh, opportunities we have to get out matter because safety plays a role in amenities, plays a role in development, plays a role in how we interact between commerce, residential, and open space. All of that ties together. It's not separate silos. And so one of the things that many people, these people up here, have been trying to figure out, how do you raise the visibility of health as an issue in the planning world in places like Los Angeles? So Richmond, California now has, has uh, moved forward with a health element. Some other California cities are beginning to do that as well. Some have built it into their development processes, like in San Francisco, where they created a new tool that developers use to uh, measure the health benefits or health unbenefits of a project. And so to begin to actually integrate these critical issues of planning and the public's health, not just private health, but public health. And so I'm going to ask a couple of questions. I have a bunch, of, obviously. I like asking questions of the other people so they can talk. But uh, I, I also want you to start thinking about what kinds of things come up when you look at the, the issues that, that, um, that Elizabeth has raised. Real quickly, uh, just as I, I try and be nice to students, this is what the Health Atlas looks like in print, and it's got a lot of stuff in it. And if you're doing a topic in any of your classes where you need data, on a whole range of things. This is also on the Los Angeles City Planning website. So you can actually go up and grab one of those little maps, source it very nicely and cite it, and use it in your projects. They are very helpful, actually, um, in giving you a wide range of demographic, demographic and other data, not just sort of classic health data. It's a very wide-ranging thing. I guess. Uh, but all three of us, Malcolm, uh, Manuel, and I have all had the opportunity to look at a draft of the plan that will be uh, an, uh, openly uh, delivered to the public on Thursday because we are part of the expert panel. And so I guess I would like to start with a simple question. What did you like about the draft? And a couple of years ago, I was uh, actually working as an attorney with the Legal Aid Foundation. and. Um, and it's pretty near and dear to the heart of USC people because there was a project um, the, of luxury housing for USC students that was being proposed for the um, area around um, the orthopedic hospital, which is, I think you know, it's a, right across the street kind of from the campus. Um, and, uh, but the, the trick was that, that, that the zoning on that project was actually zoned for medical use. And um, the, when, when, um, it, it, when, so then when they proposed to do a luxury housing, people were like, well, what about the medical use here? You know, this is a community serving medical facility. And the planning department kind of went back to, you know, their books and they were like, well, actually, we don't have anything in the planning codes that mandates that we have any kind of medical use. There's, there's, not, there's nothing we can point to that would say that we have to prioritize some kind of a medical serving facility here. And I think that was, um, you know, part of the, the conversation that came up. And there were, you know, CHC also at the kind of simultaneously, um, there's a fast food ordinance in South LA that limits the ability of, of fast food restaurants to um, to locate right around where they are, where there's already an over-concentration of them. And again, um, that, that kind of got shoehorned into the planning um, codes because the planning department was like, well, we, you know, we understand like these other issues um, about, about planning, but we don't, we, there's nothing in there that says that we need to, you know, plan for healthy food. You know, that, that's, that's a, you know, not, and, and so, you know, these you know, planners aren't, you know, they can't just make stuff out of whole cloth. They need something to grab onto to, to justify, you know, decisions that affect people's, you know, property rights. And, and so I think the, you know, the conversation, um, you know, started to turn towards, you know, let's, let's come up with something that, that would, um, that would, you know, put that there. Um, you know, I've been I've been very impressed with the the plan. I think you know, you know uh, 
um, th there's been a, a big focus on equity, and I think that's appropriate. I mean, these maps are really powerful. Um, you know, I invite all of you to go, go through the health atlas. I've spent hours just, um, you know, there's like over 100 of, of them showing all kinds of data, but, but after a while it gets very repetitive, actually. It's like you pretty much know poverty and disease and lack of um, amenities to health environment. Um, they, these things just go hand in hand in this city, and and you know it makes you kind of step back and wonder, you know, what you know what would it be like if, if you know, if everybody just switched places, you know, and the poor people were living by all the parks and the good food options and uh, where the fresh air was, and the rich people were living like where there was no parks and like. What would happen? You know, we don't. You know, we it'd be. We don't really know what would happen. Um, there would be parks in those areas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, so parks would get built pretty quickly. You know, um, but I, so I think I think that's a. To, so I think you know if there's one kind of thrust of this, of this plan is going to be to try to address that that equity issue and try to equalize that that playing field so that there's there's um you know more of a. Of, you know that the, these things are. It doesn't matter so much where you live, you know, by income or just where you live, anyways, um, in terms of your opportunity to lead a healthy life and and get around. And so, you know, we've been um, interacting with uh, planning department. We have some issues. What, you know, one of the things that we're we're trying to push a little bit at CHC um, is this is trying to create like this, these um, sub areas of the plan that would be focus particularly on health um, through like, a, you know, a, we call it a healthy kid zone, but whatever, some kind of, because they're not going to be able to do the strongest stuff citywide. So let me just say what I think is uh, really good uh, about this plan. And I think it's really important for planning students to pay attention to, because I think there's sort of three new things that are actually going to uh, play out more and more in planning in the future. The first is simply health as an integrative element. I mean, one of the things that's beneath health is the economy, uh, the environment, access to food. And, you know, essentially everything is about personal health and community health. What's interesting about this is that rather than siloing transit and housing and jobs and hospitals, it's saying that all of that contributes it contributes to personal health, it contributes to community health. And the other thing that's sort of beneath that is disassociating the notion of health from simply individual behavior. Certainly, we want everyone to exercise, uh, to not smoke cigarettes, uh, to do all of those things that reflect uh, individual responsible behavior. But what this plan does is basically say that the city's got some structural responsibility for the health of its residents by whether or not there's good food nearby, whether or not there's parks to play in, whether or not there's access to health services, and actually even whether or not there's economic activity or environmental injustice, a topic that we can get into a little bit more. So first new thing, and I think it's going to be much more uh, important, and I've been seeing this trend for the last you know, five years, ten years, with what San Francisco did with its health impact assessments, the way they're being used all over the country. If you're a planner, health elements are going to become more popular, I think, in the future. Health as an integrative element. The second thing, and I think there's some critiques you can make here, but I think uh, actually some, and, and we're about to move into a more formal participation process, but one of the things that's been an interesting hallmark of this has been its participatory character. And why I think that's important is increasingly planners need to move from the idea of formal planning processes where you present an idea and they get critiqued by a bunch of NIMBY uh, people who live right next door who think it's a crappy idea because it might help people who don't live right there, um, et cetera, et cetera, rather than those formal planning processes, which become like kabuki theater, right, with people screaming at one another. Um, instead, there was a participatory process with stakeholders bubbling up ideas from the community itself. Was it perfect? No, but it did it reflect more of a bottoms-up perspective than a top-down perspective, typical of the way we've done planning and the participation in planning in the past? Yes, and I think that's going to be a hallmark. And what that means for you all as students who are planners is that your skills as facilitators, your skills as listeners, your skills at incorporating what people come up with. We have in the, in the, off, in the room with us James Rojas, who's done a fantastic job at lifting up what communities think and communities want and putting it into planning language 
language rather than saying, here's the planning language, and I'm going to close my ears now while you talk, and then I'll go away with my own plan afterwards. So the participatory process is very important. The third thing that I think is really critical about this plan and it's going to represent something new for planners in the future is that it is unabashedly committed to equity. That is, it lifts up from the beginning the idea of disparities in terms of uh, neighborhood conditions, neighborhood access to parks, neighborhood economic conditions, the environment, etc. And I think that this unabashed attention to equity, uh, the idea that we would plan as though equity mattered, it harkens back, of course, to Davidoff and advocacy planning and that whole tradition, but it's actually becoming now part and parcel of the way planners need to do their work. And I think for three reasons beneath that, and then I'll be quiet. One is the politics. Um, you can't get something through a multicultural city. You can't get something through a city that's the capital of working poverty. You can't get something through a city that's so marked by environmental injustice unless you're paying attention to equity. So the politics of putting something in place in this city means you need to pay attention to equity. And that's going to become increasingly true all over the country. Look at the election of Bill de Blasio in New York, the lifting up of the questions of inequality there. There, the politics are moving in the direction of paying attention to inequality. Second, the economics are moving in that direction. The research is increasingly showing us that when you have an inequitable metropolitan area, you've got a metropolitan area that has a lower quality of life, slower economic conditions, less innovation and prosperity in the future. So the economics are moving in that direction as well. And then finally, interestingly, and I think we don't pay enough attention to this, the technical tools are moving in that direction as well, which means that, you know, uh, you can lift up that uh, little thing again, the health plan. You know, we could not have done that 10 years ago, or at least it would have been a ginormous, this is a technical term, pain in the ass, right? <laughs> now we have both GIS tools and we've got much more sophistication about how to measure equity. We've been able to exploit the public use microdata areas, which is how you're coming up with those life expectancy measures. That is the technical sophistication around how to measure inequity, how to deploy the data, and how to use GIS to map it means that these secrets of the, you know, you know what people knew in their heart that Southeast LA and Northeast San Fernando Valley are the places where there really should be priority, those technically can be brought up. So what that means, again, is for planners in the future, health will be an important integrative element. You're going to need skills for a new kind of participation. And equity is not an afterthought any longer. It is a forethought. It's the first step in a planning process, not the last step. What would you like to see in addition to what you read? Is there something missing from this? And I. Uh, I want to include Elizabeth in this because one of the things here is if, we know we're not going to go through an elaborate conversation about how planning in Los Angeles works, but what the health element is part of is what is known as a general plan framework, which sits up here at 30,000 feet. And then there's these community plans underneath that framework where things are supposed to come down. Right? So each of the areas are, is a community plan, South LA or West LA or various arounds. And one of the things that I want to get to, and you can talk about now or later, is in the health element, there's not a lot of talk about that connection. Right? right now, it's sort of sitting up here a little abstracted uh, at 30,000 feet. And how the process that you see up here, and I do encourage you to get on their Facebook page and get involved with uh, participation. Uh, I think it's a great idea. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see how these do connect. Reflecting on the participation process, I think that there were um, that it, it was interesting in a lot of ways in terms of the um, participation of grassroots um, community groups. Um, Elizabeth and her team kind of definitely got out there and talked to some of the key stakeholders um, and, and had, had some really good discussions. I, uh, you know, one of the, you know, there, there's always a question of resources on participation. Um, you know, if we had you know unlimited resources, we could do it. But I think there's a lot of, I, I, I think there are a lot of different ideas also about. Um, how you um, allow uh, larger numbers of of, um, of people who aren't necessarily um, part of 
the you know pro of like stakeholder groups and like who, you know who are like really actively like professionally kind of engaged in the whole process. How do you get their input? Um, and, I, and I think there there could be um, room for some more um, engagement, you know, around um, if it's. Um, you know, you know, social media, or if it's surveying, or you know, different different ways to kind of like really vet, you know, some of these recommendations across a lot of people, and, and see see what you know, see what people what really bubbles up. Um, there, there, are planning's um, other wing over in the mobility element kind of did some pretty interesting stuff um, a couple months ago with with putting out kind of an online. Um, voting, mm -hmm. you know, mechanism where there was different different priorities that were that had been identified through the process and stakeholder groups, but then, you know, see you know how things kind of bubbled up to the top according to the interest. You know, of course, that may weight things towards those who have you know more of a affinity or access to the online networks. And so you have to look at, you know, I know um, I had um, and they they just did this huge. So Detroit's going through this whole thing right now where they're um, they have a um, you know they have to kind of almost shrink down the footprint of their city because they've got 750,000 people living in a city that was built for two million. And, um, and they just can't afford to like keep the whole, and so they've been going through some fundamental processes. Um, and they, uh, um, apparently, you know, by, by kind of bringing um, electronic tools around a different means, they were able to engage like 150,000 people in that process of, of looking at, you know, what, what the future of Detroit is and, you know, really getting some good, some good feedback. So I don't know if we'll get 150, um, 150,000, Elizabeth, but, but, um, but we actually have like five times as many people here, so we, we should do something somewhere, you know, up there. Um, and, you know, I think then, you know, David kind of like put his finger on the, on the main, um, Challenge, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't even put it as a critique. I think you know you have to start a plan with a uh, thirty thousand foot level, and then um, into the process has been built um, an implementation phase. Um, I think that's of course going to be where a lot of the rubber, you know, meets the road. Um, you know, we need to get, and it, you know, it needs to come down in terms of of from policy to actually zoning codes, and and you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, one one thing I'd also just flag. That we need to think about here here in Los Angeles is we have a tradition of basically um, passing um, really great plans and then basically it, we ended up actually spot zoning in fact so you know so we so you know if we if we pass a you know a great plan that you know kind of requires that projects be built with you know pedestrian and bicyclists in mind and everything like that and you know and everything looks really good and it's everybody agrees in principle and the city passes it and it goes into the zoning code and then the first developer that comes along with a big stack of you know cash and promising all kinds of jobs um, and then the city just says oh well forget all that you know what do you want you know and and that that ends up what gets built you know, it kind of you know would Put under threat the rest of it. So I think you know a lot of part of the purpose of engaging so many, lot, as many different people as possible in it is to build that constituency that are going to actually protect you know because even if you pass it in a law in in Los Angeles that doesn't really that's not the end of the story. Um, it's a variance to the law that ends up being the, the real story. Um, and so we need a constituency out there that's going to actually come out to those meetings and and protect um, the the laws that actually get passed you know onto the books. So uh, I really like the fact that you, you let us start with all the stuff we like, so now we can turn to the usual academic uh, disposition, uh, <laughs> all the stuff where it came up short. Um, so I want to lift up uh, the sort of maybe three big things and then one little thing that, I, that I'm a little bit concerned about. So one of the, the big things, um, and one and two are connected, uh, they have to do with sort of neighborhood uh, identification and consideration of variation. So when we tend to think about a neighborhood and whether a neighborhood's doing well and look at the metrics of it, we don't usually make a difference between a stable neighborhood and a platform neighborhood. What do I mean by a platform neighborhood? A platform neighborhood is a neighborhood where a lot of immigrants arrive and in fact the sort of markers might in a sort of short term snapshot not look very good but it turns out to be a pretty good platform neighborhood from which you wind up moving later on. Right? So. 
you may have a lot of high churning in the neighborhood. You may have a lot of high poverty in the neighborhood. Uh, you may have a lot of conditions that look like the neighborhood's not doing very well, but in fact the neighborhood may be thriving as a platform neighborhood for people to, to be able to take off from. And I don't think there's any discussion in the health plan about trying to distinguish between neighborhoods that we know will be platform neighborhoods, so the entry point for immigrants, and what needs to be there in particular so that immigrants can do well. Those are different than a sort of South LA, you know, the Western part of South LA, much more stable neighborhood. If it's got the same you know, markers in terms of poverty, it might mean a much more jobless population. So I think differentiating that would be really important. It's something that's endemic in the literature in terms of basically judging neighborhood performance, but I, but I think it needs to be there. The second thing that maybe it's there, Elizabeth, but I didn't really see it, um, is the issues in, in as prominent a way as I would have liked, gentrification and displacement. That is, we've got a tremendous amount of transit-oriented development coming down. Um, you know, we're taking neighborhoods that were, uh, you know, usually places where there were a lot of low-income folks uh, living, Silver Lake, uh, Echo Park, et cetera, Koreatown, uh, the University Village area just north of here on the way to West Adams, they're undergoing tremendous gentrification pressure. And what are the strategies to make sure not just that the neighborhood becomes healthy, but that the people who are living in the neighborhood are actually able to enjoy it when the neighborhood becomes healthy? So what's the affordable housing component? What's the job training component to connect people to the jobs that might emerge from transit-oriented development? I think I saw a few hints of it in there, but it, you know that is going to be one of the central challenges for Los Angeles. You know, I like to say uh, that we have in our head the old LA, uh, which is, you know, suburban sprawl, uh, car culture, uh, and interracial conflict, right? Sort of, you know, crash, basically, right? But in fact, the the new LA is tremendous compact development, right? 5,000 people were living downtown 15 years ago. It's now 75,000. The hottest neighborhoods are the inner ring band, right? There's about to be a huge private development in East Los Angeles, which could result in some uh, displacement, et cetera. Um, so we're really becoming a compact city. Always have been, but even more so. Uh, we're investing 40 to $50 billion in mass transit. Uh, and we've got a tremendous amount of multiracial. We're a new collaboration. We're a new city. But one of the big threats in that new city is gentrification and displacement. Any health element has to be tuned to that because a place could be healthy by simply getting rid of the people who have been got the lower markers on health. Um, the third thing I think uh, that's a big thing is in terms of what the next phases of participation will be. Once you move to the formal processes, it basically kills all the life out of participation, right? Um, and one of the things I think that's going to be very important, Malcolm was actually just part of the thing that we did on transit equity, where the main outreach was to people who didn't know anything about transit or care much about it. I mean, the idea was how could we get immigrant rights groups, uh, labor groups, people who traditionally hadn't thought about transit, to think that transit and transit equity might be something for them. So I think the first phase uh, was rightfully bottom up, but with a lot of people who are already kind of interested in these issues, as Malcolm was saying. The second phase becomes formal, and because of its very formality, can kind of squeeze the enthusiasm right out. Uh, and then, if you really want it to be a living health element, there's got to be an organizing component that stretches to people who would not go to these meetings normally, and getting the city to think through that kind of major investment uh, in that organizing capacity, or how they partner up with different institutions like CHC, the Prevention Institute, others, right, uh, I think is the next big challenge. I've got a small critique, but I'll save that for later, too. So, well, I, I guess I can respond to some of the, the points that were brought up. Um, I'll start with Manuel because it's fresher in my mind. So um, you're, you're totally right that we really didn't differentiate in the plan, and, and I think even to an extent in the health atlas between um, stable and platform communities, and I think that certainly that, as, you're, as you were speaking, it's something that really kind of elevated to for us to really con to consider and really think about as we're developing policies and really trying to understand the places that we're developing policies for. Um, one of the challenges in, in working on this document is that it is a citywide element. So it's, it's this, um, and it's a long-term policy document. So these documents have a life of 10 to 20 years at times. So the challenge is in developing policies that are broad enough 
to encompass future initiatives that would really improve the city, but at the same time have the level of specificity to address the issues that we need to address today and moving forward. So I think that that's something that I would have to take back and consider, <laughs> consider a little more. Um, so gentrification and displacement, um, we do speak of it in the narrative, but it's not as, as forceful as, I, uh, as some folks would like. I think that in terms of our policies and our programs, the way in which we address it most specifically is around economic development, um, really looking at opportunities to increase access to healthy goods and services, but looking at that as a strategy for jobs for folks that live in the neighborhood. So really create, we have a couple of programs that call for development of business assistance programs or retail um, or financial incentive programs that would really allow entrepreneurs in the communities that are most impacted to really develop businesses, to receive assistance, to increase the access of goods and services and also increase jobs in their neighborhood. Um, we also feel that um, this transit neighborhood development, all of this work that's happening, these catalytic developments, be it the transit network, be it affordable housing, be it the Great Streets Initiative, these are great opportunities for workforce development for folks with barriers to employment. So our, our track is really about, um, in terms of the health element, really about economic development and trying to support and bolster opportunity for the people that live there to gain economic prosperity. Um, the housing element very thoroughly describes affordable housing and creating you know, all of those opportunities around the housing stock and our, our track is a little more focused on economic development with the health twist in supporting businesses in the communities, especially if they're providing those goods and services that are underserved. Um, and you know, in terms of our outreach, I, I think that you both kind of touched on something, and, and Manuel, you mentioned it when we um, got together in our expert panel. And it's that our, our focus for the first phase was really very much on the community folks that have been really working on these issues and are the key players. And we went out and had conversations with them and their various stakeholders. But I think that we, there's a lot of room for improvement for us to really reach out to folks that are not otherwise engaged. Um, I think an opportunity that you raise is working with LAUSD, with parents, with kids. I mean, really regular day folks that maybe aren't thinking about this, but are very much impacted by this. And um, I think that that's something we will continue to try to do. I mean, we have to have public hearings for this effort. Um, we have to have the seven planning forum public hearings. Um, but in addition to that, we will also be having, continuing to really have those small network discussions to really then be able to vet the plan. We'll have an opportunity to now say, we spoke to you before or we haven't spoken to you and this is you know the issues that we're looking at this is how we feel we can improve health and well-being what are your thoughts and how can we improve this in a very i think we prided ourselves and felt that it was very important that our outreach was really focused on discussions and conversations um, and really interacting with people and really getting some substantive feedback as opposed to just the survey part which is also important but we really want to continue to do that as well moving forward now that we will be releasing the draft. And we also will be working on some surveys to really get them out uh, via social media, to really get as many people involved and aware um, uh, of what we're trying to do with this project um, as, as we can. And certainly our goal is to really build that constituency across the city, to build the ownership with Angelinos to care about this and to own it so that they can continue to demand that ultimately the implementation be put in place because the policies are wonderful and they're great and they're important. It's part of the general plan, but ultimately we need to see the change. We need to see them implemented. And if there isn't that ownership, we, we just need to have the voice present and really kind of pushing for the kind of improvements that need to happen in these communities. So, so we have two communities and this is their health let's just say health outcomes are positive and less positive. One of the big concerns about any action like we're taking is that we're gonna make health a bigger issue in both of those communities. But if the structures are such that these people have the structures to go out and be physically active, have the structures to make better uh, decisions about their health, what may happen is they're gonna get healthier and these people are not. So the disparity between the wealthiest communities and the poorest communities could actually increase rather than decrease. What you want to have happen is for these people to get healthier and these people to move towards them. They will never reach the same level, but you want to move them up as these people are getting healthier. Now how do you do that? You've heard a lot of talk about participation. 
One of the things we have to figure out is how you engage not just the easy communities. There are people sitting in this room who can call one person who can call the mayor. Probably half of the people sitting in this room can call one person who can call the mayor or their city council person. There are actually hundreds of thousands of people in Los Angeles who can't. And so how do we make it so that those people who have easy access to power and to structures aren't benefited by what we're doing, whereas those people are don't. So you have to have a participation process that somehow doesn't just talk to the people that you usually talk to. And you want to talk to the people who don't. With those two, do you have any questions? One of the, que the serious question is about outcomes. What co outcomes do we really expect to come out of this? All three of you. Mel, uh, Mel you want to start? Do you want to start, Elizabeth? Or? Well, the, the, this lifts up uh, two things I think I'll mention uh, that'll be very concrete. They might be small, but I think they'll be very concrete. One of the things that's unique about the health element is that it calls in its uh, uh, section around creating uh, safe and just communities, uh, the idea of community policing to be sure, but also the reintegration of the formerly incarcerated. And I think where that's important is that the idea of halfway homes, uh, the idea of things that will get resisted normally by neighborhoods will actually be kind of built into the idea that planning should make space for people who have been incarcerated to reintegrate back into society. And there'll be some tools to combat the things that make sure that those services don't go into neighborhoods, I think that'll be important. Um, the second thing that I think will be kind of concrete coming out of this, there's been an initiative, and Elizabeth's quite aware of this, some others are as well, I think David, launched up by community groups called the uh, Clean Up Green Up Campaign. And the Clean Up Green Up Campaign is the idea of using uh, environmental justice metrics to figure out which neighborhoods are the most overexposed and socially vulnerable. Three neighborhoods have been lifted up for the um, uh, sort of exploratory uh, process, Wilmington, uh, San, uh, Wilmington, San Fernando, and Boyle Heights, uh, and they will be targeted for extra resources for cleaning up the neighborhood, but also greening up the neighborhood in terms of open space, in terms of greening the industries that are in the neighborhood, et cetera. This is something that's had a lot of community uh, pressure, uh, a lot of community participation. One of the good things about the health element is it sort of bakes in, that, and there's ways I would have done it differently. Uh, we could talk about sideline, but it bakes in the concept of green zones, and that makes this something that's been going through and it's sort of an experimental way to the planning commission become a formal part of the general plan. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of, I mean, if you're looking to change the world, I'm not sure the health element will do it. Um, if you're looking to improve the chances for at least some people who are formerly incarcerated to do better, if you're looking to see whether or not we can clean up some neighborhoods and green them up and provide a model for the the rest of the city. I think there's going to be some small things if people can focus in on certain key parts of it and then get down to what David was hinting at, implementation. Because the devil is going to be in the details here. How do you move from these generalities to the specifics? Those are two things I think could be really specific. The document in terms of how general plans are set up is we have our goals, we have objectives, and in this case we have very quantifiable metrics set up for each of these goals. So for example, if we're talking about the food chapter, we have um, objectives that call for uh, access to healthy foods within a quarter mile of every resident, or in increase in farmers markets, increase in community gardens, and things that are really quantifiable and measurable for the city to be able to respond to. The policies really provide the guiding direction to decision makers on how we develop programs, how we fund initiatives, and really considerations as they consider land use actions. And really what we have is this action plan, which I think is a critical first step in implementation, which we developed about 75 programs that are the implementation tools for these various policies. And I think ultimately that that's where it's going to be. It's going to be in getting the funding, getting the prioritization to implement these initiatives in the communities that are in need and most underserved around these various topics. So it, it is this, this political initiative that needs to be put in place and certainly this constituency within the, the public to really support these efforts. But um, the implementation of the plan will happen through the policies being in place. They provide that guiding direction for the city and also through implementation tools. Um, but we do have object objectives that are very metric based around these various topics. Um. 
So um, I, I think both of mine are, you know, aspirational outcomes, you know, that, that I hope. Um, but I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I think we really hope will come out of this is just playing that there will be more space allocated in the city towards health promoting um, land uses. And so that's, that includes parks, that includes health clinics, that includes healthy food options. Um, you know, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of this comes down to, you know, what, you know, what space is going to be um, reserved over? We in, in our um, CHC's kind of uh, fast food campaign, we call it a safe spaces for healthy places. And it was it just basically the reality is that if something is not kind of taken, if zoning isn't fairly strong to kind of reserve something for healthy promoting land use, the, the more money making one will probably predominate. Um, you know, a lot of the times. Um, so we're just we, we hope that'll be a a big outcome is just that that space will get reserved. Um, and then, I, and then this one's a little bit more, um, you know, fuzzy. But I, I, I think, you know, you know, right now there isn't a, a good space within um, the development process when there's a development project that's being proposed or a transportation project. Or there isn't a good space for to talk about health impacts. Um, Dr. Pastor talked about in San Francisco they are using health impact assessments, and we've we've done a few of those down here, kind of informally, like just advocates kind of shoehorning that into the process, but to have some kind of formal place where um, health is, you know, it is, it is mandated by the city to be a part of the conversation when you're deciding whether to approve a development project and what kind of mitigation there, there will be and, and all, all those kinds of considerations. I think that'll be, if we can get that, that'll be a huge outcome to this. Okay, so question is, how do neighborhood councils play into this? Everybody knows that the neighborhood councils are uh, part of the 1990 uh, charter reform uh, in which we developed a set of self-organizing neighborhood councils around the, the, the city. So um, they, they're, they're involved in the process. Um, early on, um, when the project kicked off, we um, made presentations to the regional alliances of neighborhood councils. Gosh, how many are there, like seven, ten? across the geographies and we're actually now in the process of going out to them again to let them know that we are having these planning forums uh, public hearings in their geographies we're hoping they will adopt a forum help us pay for food <laughs> but um, they're, they're very much a part of the process we went out in the beginning and we're going out again and there's certainly partners to really help us spread the word about the project to folks again that are not typically engaged through some sort of advocacy organization why should we care and it's a really good one. How do we build a process so that uh, some young person in South LA cares about this or some old person at USC, like me, cares about it? And is it only going to be planning nerds talking to planning nerds, or are we going to have really a wide-ranged set? I think, um, you know, certainly that's a critical question. And I think the way that we do that is by breaking it down. I mean, one of the very fundamental questions that we asked folks during our engagement is, what is your vision for a healthy city? What is it? And, you know, leave it open. And, and certainly those topics came up. It's a city that has clean environment, a city that has parks, that is safe, that has jobs, that um, has housing that is safe. I mean, really breaking down to the most fundamental level, uh, having a conversation. Uh, no jargon, no technical you know, data, just really having that conversation around the various issues that we identified and really opening ourselves up to hear what people think needs to happen in their communities to improve their health and well-being because they know, they are the experts, they live in those communities every day. And it's our job as planners to listen and translate that into something that we can move forward a healthy agenda but I think you're totally right and you're the expert <laughs> really breaking down and you know making things interactive that's certainly something we're thinking about for our planning forums we intend to have activities for youth and children as well because as a mother of two I know that I will not go to any kind of public meeting unless there's something for my kids to do so we want everyone to participate this is really the, the city's plan and, and, and people should care because this is our city's plan. This is an opportunity to elevate health and their well-being, and they should be part of the process, and they should have ownership. So it is our job to make that accessible. Um, and we're always wel welcoming your recommendations, James. <laughs> In the back. Um, we're going to have to disagree. I think that the main focus should be safety because I, I live by a lot of parks, and I grew up in poverty. Yeah. And even if the park is clean, I'm not going to go if it's not safe. Yeah. I know a lot of parks. I know a lot of parks that are out there that it's a, it's a gang member park. 
the swings that never get touched, all these things that never get touched. And they're clean because nobody's touching them, but it's not safe. <laughs> it's not safe at all. So I grew up, I've always lived by a park because I've always been in sports and my dad always took me to the park to work out and stuff. But if, if my dad wasn't with me, I was never going to the park. And a lot of people don't even have dads to do that. And so they're not going to be going to the parks because moms are scared. They're, oh no, there's a gang over there, there's people over there. A lot of people get killed at parks. And I feel like in the, in the inner city, that's a big problem with the safety. First, the safety needs to be there, and then the health, so they can first even have the chance to go there to see that it's clean, and it needs to be maintained. Like, you need to have people at the park watching, people all there. And that's why when nobody's there, people feel like they can do whatever they want, and it's free reign to the community. And in poverty <coughs> communities, the people who, are, who have the free reign are the gang members and the drug dealers and all that stuff. He, as usual, is wonderfully articulate. Uh, and so what the conundrum is, what comes first? Uh, can you have a park or you have to have a safe community? Can you have a safe community and no park? And one of the issues here is always, you know, we look at this as a set of things we need to do rather than an integrated agenda of what needs to happen. And as DJ says, it is, you got to be safe or you're not going to go to the park. You got to be safe or you're not going to walk in your neighborhoods. You got to be safe or you're not going to go to the healthy new grocery store. And those all work together. Malcolm? You know, one of just also responding to um, Elizabeth's um, or, or the previous question that, you know, one of the ways to, in, in my view, make the planning process a lot more um, engaging is, is to actually, um, build on the existing issues that are going on in, in, a, in a certain community. And, and, and so, you know, it's not a completely abstract thing. Of, you know, what would you, what's, what's your dream city, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, that, um, but when there's actually ongoing, you know, battles that are, that are happening, you know, over issues that have to do with health. Um, and, 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 and so I think the health element is, is, is done some things that are interesting along those lines of, of actually trying to incorporate some of the, you know, existing you know issues that are out there, and, and, um, but you know, you know, it, it kind of on that particular issue of safety, it also goes into um, programming. So in, in, in LA, we've had um, the Friday Night Lights, um, um, you know, program, um, you know, which is um, you know where where the you know they basically have um, programming at parks that goes into you know all, all summer long, all evening until late, like past midnight. Um, when there's when there's city, you know, there's officials there, there's rec, rec and park um, people, and, and in every neighborhood that they've done that, they've seen a, a radical reduction in the uh, amount of violence, crime that weekend. You know, events that go along, and and, 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 it, and you know, if you go out there, I don't know if you you know if you go visit it, you know, one of these few months, you know, there's you know all the you know kids from every age are out there, you know, from the little toddlers all the way up to teenagers to the adults, everybody's out there. Um, you know, having a good time on, in, in, you know, because it's uh, they've created enough energy at nighttime with the lights and the and the staff and everything to create an environment that feels safe and and that's just you know you know it just keeps people off. But the, but if we can kind of do stuff like that, but then you know maybe that's the those are the people we need to be talking about about what the improvements to, to the park needs to be. So if we can start with what's already happening and working at some of the parks, but maybe. You know, this park needs an improvement, or maybe it needs, a, you know, there needs to be another park similarly, like not that far away, where, you know, and, and you kind of start building on it. Um, but I, I think, I think, you know, tapping into the, the actual issues that are happening right now, even as you're doing long-term planning, I think to me is a, a really important way to kind of address, you know, you know that issue. I'm going to ask you to hang on because I want to get one more question. In. If you're interested in that, look up Gang Reduction Youth Development, the GRID program, G R Y D at uh, Los Angeles, they're the people that run the summer night lights. Really interesting, in the back. Real quickly, uh, the question is about the climate change impacts upon our cities and how that interacts with the health element. Sure, so certainly climate change is something that we address as part of the health element and 
really what we're looking at um, creating policies that promote green building design and, and I, I should actually take a step back and say that climate change is something that the city as a whole is thinking about it and we're thinking about it as part of the health and wellness element and the transportation folks in the mobility plan 2035 are also developing initiatives around this so we have policy in place that really speak to the built environment and promoting green building design increasing the tree canopy um, we have a policy that really speaks to resilience because uh, climate change, like many other impacts, impact, uh, like many other issues, impacts underserved communities more greatly. The areas in the city with the greatest health disparities are those that have the lowest tree canopy, suffer from the greater temperature, um, the, the, the greater um, ranges in temperature, really are the most impacted. So we do have policy language that speaks to resilience. And we have several uh, programs in place that speak to climate change, uh, specifically the, uh, the preparation of a climate adaptation plan for the city. So that's an implementation measure for the city to kind of take on and figure out how they're going to establish a climate adaptation plan. So I'm going to let you, Manuel, this is your last comment because we're about to close up. So. Oh, darn. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, I guess that one of the things that uh, uh, comes up for me then is that uh, in terms of thinking about the, I mean two things then. Uh, one is in terms of the climate change issues, you know, we've worked in this with the climate gap and stuff like that. And the current way that the Cal Enviro screen, which is your main tool for identifying environmental justice communities, does not yet have a climate layer in it. Uh, and it's actually uh, problematic because it's not yet shifted, although it will, to census tracts. So one of the really specific and nerdy admonitions is to not freeze the current tool you've got, because I think the next version of that tool, because we're working with them, will have much more sensitivity to racial disparities, uh, climate vulnerabilities, and actually be much more geographic specific. The second thing, which is actually specific, but I think it's also useful, is if you really want to encourage community participation, uh, one of the things I would suggest is a, a contest uh, for high school students uh, to answer the question, what would a healthy city look like? And to engage uh, high school students into some sort of visioning, set of visioning exercises that feeds into the health element with some kind of big conference or celebration to which their parents would be invited, who would then be brought into the planning process themselves. Because that's the best way to get at the parents. And there's remarkable, I mean, any of you who work with some of the young people in Los Angeles know that they are, rem uh, you know, remarkably uh, concerned about the environment, remarkably concerned about climate, know a remarkable amount, actually about the built environment as well, because so many of them are transit dependent. And they also recognize the issues of safety that the young man in the back was lifting up, et cetera. So I think anything you can do to invo involve high school students uh, in actually helping you vision, feed information up, and use that as a conduit to other people would actually be really good and relatively low cost. Um, I, mean, I think we've we've covered uh, a, a lot of it. Uh, you know, I, I think um, you know one of the conversations. You know, I, I think the climate issue is, is, is something that is definitely sh you know should be looked at. I, I, you know, one of the things I've, I've been trying to impress upon people is just you know why why can't we have this conversation about th there's all these items that 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 overlap between climate and health, no matter how you look at it, resilience, adaptation, mitigation. Um, you know, reduction of, of emissions, but they all, but they overlap between health and, and climate. There's, a whole, or, you know, tons of issues. And, and if we could just lift those up, we, it, it seems like, you know, that would be another way to get, mm -hmm. get them prioritized, um, you know, within the, the public sphere, um, you know, when they're kind of a double bottom, bottom line in, the, in mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, but I think, um, you know, there, it's, you know, I think you guys should all, take a close look at what's what's happening here it's you know you're living in a city where you know we're charting um, a cutting edge piece of, of, of the planning literature there, there aren't a whole lot of cities in the United States that have done healthy um, you know, health elements of the general plan we are following you know Europe has been on this healthy city movement you know for like a whole generation now um, and so you know the, you know we're, we're, we're definitely learning from that um, but I think we're, we're going to see it manifest itself in all kinds of different and unique ways that are that will be really um, interesting and hopefully influential in terms of you know going forward in the planning field. Uh -huh. um, gosh, oh, I, you know I'd like to thank all of you and really all of the people that really have provided us feedback in the development of this document. 
Um, we ask that you, I was you know, being funny, but at the same time I'm being serious to really spread the word about this document. Make, we want as many people as possible to read in, to give us feedback, and to really participate in the engagement process. If there are folks that you recommend we speak to that maybe you're working with or you're aware of, if you live in the community and you feel that there are community groups that we need to talk to, this needs to get out. It needs to be, it'll only be the best document that it will be if it's fully informed by the stakeholders in the city. So that is our goal. Um, thank you for having me and for being here today. Sitting in this conversation, having read the health element, done all those things, is it raised, I'm a planning historian, as many of you know, it raises a question about the concept of the, the general plan. So I went back, California, uh, mandated what they called master plans in 1929, 20 years after the first acknowledged city plan in the United States, the plan of Chicago. And what struck me is these were all done by silo. So transportation is separate from housing, is separate from land use, is separate from open space. But what you've heard today is that they're actually integrated. They actually influence each other. And one of the difficulties about general plans is you have to figure out what goes here rather than here. How do you make, you can't duplicate. So it's got to go in one of those places. And as planners, we have this issue that we have this continuing ability to create these visions. And then as Malcolm talked about it, and as Mel will talk about it, and as uh, Professor Flett is going to get into, when we get to the codes, the zoning codes, and to the implementation, that vision and implementation seem to struggle with each other. And part of that is, is up here our vision is by silo. And down here, developers are actually building stuff that isn't, that is TOD, that is tied to where are the parks, what is tied to where the commerce is. And so that connection is a very difficult one. And what I love about this is uh, one of the comments that came out early, I think it was Malcolm, but we need to protect that vision when we get to implementation, which means we have to figure out how to translate that vision that's in the health element into the actual activity of the city. Would you please thank our panelists? <laughs>